is what is Spring Extensions and how does it relate to the Spring community? Right, it's a good question. Um, Spring Extensions is essentially an incubator. Okay, so we had Spring modules, it was doing a great job, but it got out of its end of life effectively. What it ended up being was a lot of code that solved a lot of problems, some of them very good problems that needed to be solved, but these, these different projects, these different concerns didn't evolve at the same rates. The quality levels between different pieces of code in Spring modules differed sometimes greatly. And we only had one, effectively a jar that we could um, deliver for Spring modules each time. So we spent a lot of time waiting for certain pieces of code and Jira issues to be fixed before we could release anything. Um, it got past its end of life, essentially. So Spring Extensions is a recognition of some of those problems. We've looked hard and long at the Apache Software Foundation's incubation ex exercises. We have Jim Jagielski in, in Spring Source, and he was one of the leaders involved in that. So we've take, taken all that knowledge, that serendipitous knowledge that's sitting out there, and built Spring Extensions to solve the same problem. How do we get community-led projects uh, that have their own unique identity that can be placed in the incubator, given a formal process to follow, to eventually make it into fully supportable, um, quality open source, professional open source projects. And that's what Spring Extensions is all about. Okay, that, that sounds like an exciting, exciting movement, but are there any interesting uh, projects in the incubator right now? That yeah, like yeah there's, um, right now, interesting is a different, you know, depending on, depending on what yeah, it's, it's you're trying to scratch, I suppose some of them will be more interesting than others. But Spring Python is one I'd like to point out because that was one of the first sort of trailblazers on it. Um, the project lead, Greg Tanquist, who happens to be in Melbourne, Florida, which is the same place as our web team, but he was working for Harris International. He created a, um, the, the same basic um, ideas that were in the Spring, uh, Spring Framework and applied them to the Python environment. And as it happens, the same challenges were there. He's got a, at the moment we have a, a rudimentary dependency injection container, we have um, an aspect oriented programming, we have consistent data access APIs, all given a Python bent because the Python community really cares about things being Pythonic and we recognize that. So we have to try and respect that. And one of the things that we've done very recently is to refactor some of that code whilst it's in sort of early incubation phase mm -hmm. to give us a foundation we can then develop um, mechanisms to configure the container to feel more Pythonic to the Python users, essentially to increase adoption and, and show people they can actually work with these sorts of frameworks without getting bogged down in XML. Okay, you mentioned making more Pythonic, so what do you call a bean in a Python? Um, well, right now we're calling it a component. Okay. There's some baggage with that, so that might need to be looked at at some point. <laughs> uh, Spring.net would call it an object, for example. Um, yeah, the Java world has its beans. So what we try to do with these, these initiatives is not do a direct port. So you don't end up with exactly the same code base in both places. Um, there are different concerns depending on your environment. We respect that. And in the case of Python, there's, there's different style that people bring to the mix. And we have to be very careful around that. Otherwise, it will not be attractive to developers in the community. OK. Uh, you mentioned Spring.net. Um, does it have anything to do with Spring extensions? Or how does it relate to Spring yeah. and Spring Python. Well, Spring.net, I mean, it's, it's way beyond extensions now. It's a full portfolio project. We do training on it. We do support on it. It's, you know, it's even, we're starting to look at commercial value adds to it. And it's, it's, it's a very popular part of our portfolio. Um, but it did sort of set the, set the standard. And by hook or by hook or by sheer determination, it actually went from being an open source project led up by Dr. Mark Pollock to them being something that became a Spring portfolio project, but it did it um, in an informal fashion. What Extensions tries to do is give the same uh, a formal process to these things, so that people that have a starting point, if someone comes up with a new idea, they, they have now a formal process to go through mm -hmm. to potentially reach the heights of Spring.net. We make no promises, um, but we do say you know that if you're going to, if that's the aim, if you would like to get to a point where you're really developing professional open source projects that have a chance of being in the portfolio, this is the route to take. Okay, that sounds very exciting. So how do developers get involved? Well, first of all, um, either you already have a project that you're working on, some code already maybe, or you have an idea. And I would like to stress it's not just developers, it's often partners, 
as well. Um, companies will turn around and say we have something that may be of interest, perhaps we're building it on top of Spring. Um, so the idea is the first point of contact is myself right now. We're in a pilot phase, we're, we're ready to go with the uh, public website for it, but we haven't rolled it out just yet. So for now it's contact me. Um, we then have a proposal process which I'll typically coach the person through or the, or the company and we take it from there. Okay, well thanks very much for your, for your time. Cheers, thanks. Thank